got me? Good? All right, as you make your way back to your seats, um, did everybody get a bulletin today? Because I need one. I think there's one over here. Is there one over here for me? No? Let's see if that's one. Yeah, mine's in there. That's good. All right, well, if you do have a bulletin, I got it. Take it out, and um, let's pull out some notes. Anybody need a bulletin? We got this fine usher right here who's going to take care of you. All right. Now, your uh, notes today are going to look a little different. You'll see a lot of arrows with blanks. I'm putting you to work today, all right? There's a chart that we're going to be filling out based on our passage of Scripture, Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. Galatians 4, 21 through 31. I want you to turn there and follow along. As a pastor prayed this morning, one of the things he prayed about, which was taking place um, while we were having church last week, was the shootings down in Orlando. Um, very, very sad. And one of many terroristic attacks that you know, we as a country have had to deal with. Um, we know the rest of the world has been dealing with them for centuries and decades. Um, and more and more we're seeing those things happening now within our own country. And it's sad and it's difficult. And many of the terroristic attacks over the years um, have been fueled um, to some extent uh, through, I guess the term is radical Islam. A lot of politicians don't want to use that uh, because we don't want to throw all Islamic folks under a bus and say they're all terrorists because that's not true at all. But... Um, the vast majority of those who are in Islam are from what we would call the Arab world, Arab countries. And uh, this morning's text is fascinating because if you ever wondered, like, where did all the tension, the strife, the conflict, and even terrorism, where did all that kind of start? Where did it all germinate? It actually is going to be covered to some extent through our text this morning. Um, the tension between Israel and the Arab world, as well as Christians in the Arab world. Um, a lot of it is going to be found within the context of this text. So what I'd like to do is, uh, is pray. We'll read the text together, uh, and then we'll go through this chart. A uh, very powerful illustration the, the Apostle Paul is about to give us. So let's, let's do that. So God, thank you once again for Father's Day. Thank you for... Uh, the privilege, Lord, of for those of us who are fathers to, to have that title and to strive to live it out in a way that would honor and please and reflect your heart. I'm thankful, God, so much for the dad that I had and still have. Um, Lord, we know even through the dementia, uh, he's not quite the same, but um, his love for people, his love for ministry, and his love for God was something that he instilled in me even as I was a young boy. And I'm um, so thankful for my dad today. But Lord, we live in a world where um, it's just really messed up in so many ways. We know sin has done that, and the strife and conflict around our world is, is, uh, is heart-wrenching, God, because of the people that have lost their lives um, to these terroristic attacks. And we certainly do pray for those folks that were touched in a very negative way by what took place in Orlando. And uh, again, one of many uh, shootings and violence and bombings, all kinds of things, Lord, throughout uh, the last even several months that we've had to, to, to witness and read about and see on the news. So God, just help us as we read this text to, to really see how important it is to be on the right side of the ledger when it comes to faith versus works, when it comes to grace versus the law. And we know Paul was passionate to help the church of Galatia to see their way through the confusion that they were going through because those who wanted to turn them away uh, from grace. And so help us, Father, not to turn away from grace either as we read these words in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are in Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 21. I'm going to uh, read it in the New American Standard uh, translation this morning. Verse 21 says, Paul writes, Tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one 
by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. So it is now also. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Now, in your uh, notes, I have in the introduction, it says two ways to live. And I want you to correct that because as I was reflecting on some things even early this morning. I said, you know what? Let's do three ways to live. So what you got to do is in your notes, you've got to cross out two and you have to write in three ways to live. The first way is going to come up on the screen and that's as slaves under the law. As slaves under the law. And in parenthesis, we have also the the word works, the works of the law, trying to keep the law. Uh, Today in our day and age, we talk about trying to be a good person and trying to do all the things that we think are right things that we should be doing and not doing the things on the other side where we shouldn't be doing these things. And a lot of people think somehow by the way I live, if I can be good enough, I'm going to be accepted by God. So in our modern day, you know, that's kind of like following the law, following uh, the law of works. But Paul calls it living as a slave. We talked about that last week. A second way to live is as free children, free children under grace as free children under grace, and in parenthesis, faith. Not, not of works, but faith. And I decided to add the third way because there are plenty of people in our world today, maybe you're one of them, that you're not a slave under the law. It's not like you're really trying to work your way to heaven and, and, and that being a good person maybe is the most important thing, and maybe it is really important. You're trying to, to follow things in, in the Bible, which is a good thing. But maybe that's not you, and maybe you're not as living as a free child either. Maybe you haven't come to faith in Christ and be born again as a child of God spiritually. We're going to talk about that. Maybe the third way that you're living, and you have to write this in because it's not going to be on the screen or in your notes, is as a slave to sin. As a slave to sin. And, and that may be the majority of people in our world who aren't trying to find their way to God by really living a righteous life, and they're not trying to find their way to God by you know, accepting him as Lord and Savior and living as a free child under grace, under faith. There's a, that larger group of people. The third way to live is as a slave to sin. And this life is the end all be all and I'm gonna have as much fun as I can have now and I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And, and religion is for other people who feel that they need a crutch or they need something to believe in. But for those people and many in our world, they're not, they're not in any particular faith or religion. They're just trying to live the life that, you know, would bring about uh, their own, you know, uh, fulfillment. So add that third way to live, and you have to answer that question, ultimate question for you. How are you choosing to live? What mindset do you have? What philosophy are you living by? But Paul goes on to give us next a very powerful illustration. And very appropriate for today being Father's Day, he goes back to Father Abraham. Father Abraham, who he, he mentions had two sons. So one thing you need to do with me today, if you're really going to be able to track with me today, you've got to be able to put a marker in the book of Genesis because we're going to go back to Father Abraham and Sarah and the whole situation that he faced. So you want to kind of have a marker in Genesis chapter 16. 
and also chapter 18 and also chapter 21. We're going to read some excerpts, but you've got to stick with me or you're going, to, you're going to lose it here, okay? So what we read in Galatians chapter 4 was Paul saying, tell me those of you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? Now the law, again, is not just all the rules, you know, in certain books of the Old Testament, but, you know, everything that Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those five books encompass for the Israelites the law. And then specifically in the book of Genesis, Paul says, you know, have you not read the law about Abraham who had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman? So the first blank that I want you to put in above the first set of arrows is bondwoman, verse 22, and free woman. So Abraham had two sons, one through a bondwoman, one through a free woman. Now, who were those two women? Number one, on the one side of the page, and this will come down as well in your notes, Hagar, and the free woman was who? Sarah. Was Sarah. Now, let's turn back to Genesis chapter 16, and I want to read uh, what happened in this Account in Genesis 16, 1 through 7. It says, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, and Abram, before he was called Abraham, had the name Abram, and God changed his name to Abraham. Now Sarah, or Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Now remember, this is after God made a promise that, Abraham, I'm going to bless you with, with a seed, with, with children that are going to be more than the sands on the seashore. But it says she had no children, and as an, she had, but she did have an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children through her. And it says next that Abram listened to the voice of of Sarah. Now this, this, this takes me back. It reminds me of something else in Scripture even before this time. Anybody, does that remind you of anything? Yeah, Adam and Eve, right? Adam listened to the voice of his wife. You know, she took and she ate of the fruit, gave it, and he did what she wanted. And after Abram, not that we're blaming the wife, okay, don't, don't go there. And after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, actually, you know, some translations, slave or servant. She wasn't a free woman. And gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress despised Despised in her, uh, she became despised in her sight. And Sarah said to Abram, may the wrong done me be upon you. <laughs> this is a little blame game here. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. All right, so that's, that's part of the story. So we read about Hagar's situation. Again, reminding us a lot of Adam and Eve. But I want you to turn over to Sarah's situation a little later in Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Genesis 18, 9 through 14, it says, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? Now what's happening here is uh, God actually sends, we believe, you know, three angels to meet with Abraham. And they said to Abraham, where is, your, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. The angel of God saying to Abraham, when we come back next year at this time, you're going to have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent, which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing years. And Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And so once again, God says, I'm going to fulfill a promise, Abraham, and through your seed I'm going to make a great nation. 
And many are going to be blessed. In fact, every nation in the world will be blessed because of you. But it's going to be through a promised child through Sarah. But of course, we know the story. They, they were impatient, weren't they? Abraham and Sarah, and especially Sarah. You know, I, I just can't get pregnant, you know? And so she comes up with a plan B on her own, and Abram goes along with it. Let's take things into our own hands. Can we really trust that God's going to bless you, Sarah, with a child at this stage of the game? Now, let's go back to the passage in Galatians chapter 4. Because basically he says, Paul does, that Hagar is a representation of Mount Sinai. It says that, um, verse 23, but the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh and the son of the free woman through the promise. We're going to talk about that in a second. This is allegorically speaking. Now, it doesn't mean allegorically means that this was some made-up story, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and so forth. No, this was a real story, but the way he was using it with the two wives of Abraham showed that there were two covenants, it says in verse 24. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves, she is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. So in your notes, you put Mount Sinai and attached to that the law, because where did the law get presented to the children of Israel? On Mount Sinai with who? With Moses. So when he talks about two covenants, he's talking about the Mosaic covenant and on the other side, the Abrahamic covenant. Mount Sinai and the law. And uh, click uh, one more time, uh, Sean, because there's also the idea of that Mount Sinai, the law, was also Jerusalem. And uh, not just, uh, well, physical Jerusalem at that time. And we know when Paul was writing, the Israelites who were living in Jerusalem were slaves under which empire? The Roman Empire. So understand he's talking historically, but he's also sharing some things figuratively that the, the children of Hagar would be slaves. And Mount Sinai, the law was in a sense what Paul was saying, putting people into slavery, feeling they had to keep every jot and tittle of the law in order to make it to God. And Jerusalem, the, the actual city where they were as slaves to the Roman Empire. In other words, keeping the Mosaic Covenant, if you keep the law, you will be blessed. But on the other side of the ledger, coming from Sarah, the free woman, is Jerusalem above. Now, that word above is really important because was he talking about physical city of Jerusalem? The answer is no. Above means he was talking about a heavenly city of Jerusalem, uh, the heavenly throne of God in heaven that one day would come down. And let's uh, click to the next slide because it's, I have a picture of Mount Sinai and I have a picture of, uh, a picture of what Jerusalem is supposed to look like according to Revelation chapter 21, the, meaning the new heavenly Jerusalem. That's a picture of Mount Sinai. That's what it looked like. That is the mountain that Moses went up on to get the law. And the children of Israel were camped below. And you remember the cloud would come over the top of that mountain, the thunder and lightning, uh, representing the presence of God at the top of that mountain. On the right-hand side, you see what Revelation talks about as the, the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven to earth. You see at the bottom, the physical Jerusalem with the Dome of the Rock. It's how it looks today. That's not how it looked in Paul's day. The Dome of the Rock wasn't there, that, that, that gold uh, building. But on the top, you've got a cube. Why a cube? Because in Revelation, John describes this kingdom of God coming from heaven, this new Jerusalem, and he gives the dimensions. And guess what the dimensions describe? A cube. Now, that, that kind of seems weird to us. Um, and again, is it uh, symbolic or is it literal that the kingdom of God is going to be in this cube? But everything that John talks about, about the, the kingdom of God, and the new Jerusalem is absolutely amazing. That's where we hear about the streets of gold and the pearly gates and the crystal sea and the throne of God surrounded by a rainbow of jewels. And uh, it's going to be interesting when we get there to see exactly what that new Jerusalem will be like. But that was part of the Abrahamic covenant and that was a covenant of grace. God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. 
I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees. I want you to trust me. And through you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a great nation. And every nation on the earth is going to be blessed because of you. But it was a covenant based on grace and blessing versus the law and slavery. Look at verse 23 again in Galatians chapter 4. Where it says, But the son of the bondwoman, that's Hagar, was born according to the flesh. What does that mean, according to the flesh? It means through the no normal, ordinary way that children come into this world. Physically conceived between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. So it was a normal, ordinary conception. But it goes on to say, But the son by the free woman through the promise. Or earlier it says, was born by the Spirit. So one by the flesh versus one by the, the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, the son that would come through Hagar was going to be born in a normal physical way. The son that was going to be born to Sarah through Abraham was going to be miraculous. Why? Because how old was Sarah when she had her baby? She was in her 90s. How old was Abraham? He was 100 years old when they conceived Isaac, who we'll get to in just a second. This was a miraculous. Now, do we say it's the same type of miraculous conception of like the birth of Jesus, a virgin birth? No. But it was still pretty miraculous that Abraham and Sarah were able to have a child at their age. And this child was born through the Spirit. But also note in your notes as we're going down the chart that the, the, the child born in the flesh would be in slavery in that Jerusalem under the law of Mount Sinai in slavery. Whereas the child born through Sarah would be born through the Spirit, a miraculous birth, and that child would be born through a free woman, and that child would be born in freedom versus slavery. And there's a quote in verse 27 from Isaiah chapter 24, or 54, excuse me, about the barren woman would have more children than, than the one that was not barren and had children through her husband. So let's take it down one more further. So who were these sons of Abraham? One was Ishmael. One was Isaac. And I want you to turn back. Let's read about Ishmael in Genesis chapter 16, verses 11, excuse me, 7 through 11. Genesis 16, 7 through 11. Here's what it says. Now the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water. Now remember, it was Sarah's idea, right, for Hagar to get married to her husband, to have a second wife, to have a child through her. But what happened after she got pregnant? She was despised by Sarah. All of a sudden, she was, Sarah was incredibly jealous. It was her idea, but she was treating, mistreating Hagar. And Hagar goes out, and she just tries to get away from her. She's out by a spring on the way to Shur. And this angel says to Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarah, then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they shall be too many to count. And the angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael. Ishmael, which means the Lord hears. And so we have this son, Ishmael, and this is kind of, again, the story, the backstory behind what Paul is talking about. But then we also have the son that came through Sarah, the miraculous son, his name, Isaac. And we read about him in verse 28 of Galatians chapter 4. It says, And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. Children of promise. What was the promise? The promise was that salvation would come through grace and through faith. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works of the law, but by faith. So Isaac was born with that freedom. And all the children of Isaac, the nation of Israel, would have that opportunity to put their faith in, in God as well. So we have Ishmael, we have Isaac. And through Ishmael, let's continue our notes, came not just one nation. Remember, it said, God, I'm going to make nations out of you. I'm going to bless your child, Hagar, that, that they will, he will be great and the father of many nations. That is the Arab nations, right? And that, so this is where the Arab nations came from. 
They were actually children of Abraham, ultimately, but through the slave woman Hagar. Interesting. And what nation would come out of Isaac? The nation of Israel, God's chosen people, the children of promise, the children born of the free woman who would be a part of that blessing to the world. Well, you know and I know that throughout history, the Arab nations and Israel have not gotten along very well, have they? This is going to blow your mind when I show you this next slide. I want to show you the Arab world and the nations that are, came from Ishmael versus the nation that came through Isaac. Let's take a look at this Those in yellow are all the nations that came from Ishmael. This is the Arab world. So what do you have on there? What do you see? What nations? You got Egypt, Liberia, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Qatar, uh, Yemen, Somalia, Algeria, Morocco, I mean, some of these nations, Tunisia, some of these nations, you may not even, you don't hear too much about on the news, but, you know, some of these nations, I'm like, well, I forgot about that one, or that one I don't even wreck. You know, we're talking about a huge portion of the world. And then look at the little blue nation. What nation is that? Israel. And you ever look at that? I mean, the yellow are the children of Ishmael. The blue is the children that came through Isaac from Abraham and Sarah, the child of blessing, the child of promise. Does that look a little off to you? I mean, God said, through you, Abraham, I am going to bless you, and you're, you know, your seed are going to outnumber the sands and the seashore. Does that look like that to you? No. And the reason is because was God talking about physical seed? No. He was talking about spiritual seed. See, now did there become a wonderful nation of Israelites through Abraham and Isaac and his son Jacob and all that? Absolutely. But we also know that the Arab nations have hated Israel. I have to say that very openly. I mean, history just shows it. And we will read about that in just a moment. But understand that Israel... That Isaac was a spiritual father of all who would come to faith, spiritual seed. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the persecution. Let's look at verse chapter four of Galatians, verse twenty-nine. Because here's what it says. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh, who was that? Who was born according to the flesh? Ishmael, through Hagar persecuted him who was born according to the spirit who's that Isaac and the Israelites so it is now also so note please in, in your in your chart here verse 29 that the children of Ishmael became persecutors towards the nation of Israel who became the persecuted now, let me, let me show you even where that started. Genesis chapter 21. Turn back to Genesis. Come on, track with me here. Genesis chapter 21. It actually started when Ishmael was 14 years old and Isaac, his uh, half-brother, was born. So Genesis chapter 21, verses um, 1 through 9. It says, Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore, bore to him, Isaac, which, by the way, his name means laughter. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old 
when his son Isaac was born to him. Um, in another passage, I don't think I read it, he was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. So that means now that Isaac was being born, how old was Ishmael? 14 years old. It says, And Sarah said, God made laughter for me. That's why she, they named him Isaac. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. And then look at this, verse 8. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But look at verse 9. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, Ishmael. How old? 14 years old. She saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham. And what was that son doing? Mocking. Laughing derisively at this little baby who was being weaned from his mother. What did, uh, what did Sarah do when she heard that she was going to have a baby in her old age? She laughed. And what did her, you know, <laughs> what did Ishmael do when that baby was being weaned? Laughed derisively, mocking. Ishmael, the father of the Arab nations, even at that young age, mocking the children or the child of Sarah, the promised child. Why was he mocking? Most of the, it might have been jealousy. Most of the scholars I've read said, you know, maybe he thought, you know, he's the oldest son of Abraham. Who's going to be the primary heir of Abraham? The oldest son. Maybe that's why he was mocking. Little did he know he wasn't going to get the inheritance from Abraham. He was not going to be an heir to his father, even though he was the oldest son. Interesting passage. And so the persecuting of the children of Ishmael to Isaac and the children of Israel has, has started right here in Genesis chapter 21. Very interesting. But let's continue to read uh, Genesis chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, because what happens next? Sarah was obviously fuming that uh, Ishmael was mocking her child. It says, therefore, she says to Abraham, drive out this maid and her son, for the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. And it says the matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son, meaning Ishmael. You know, Abraham still loved his son Ishmael. It was still part of his his seed so he was put in a very difficult place but God basically said to Abraham Abraham listen to your wife again probably shouldn't have the first time but listen to your wife this time and send them out and so next thing in your notes is that they are cast out Hagar and her son are cast away and you can read the story Abraham gives them a sack of, of, of water and a little bit of, of, uh, of food and says, be on your way. And it says they went to Beersheba, I believe it was, and were camping out. And God took care of, of Hagar and her, her son Ishmael. But verse 29 of Galatians chapter four is another quote. It says, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Again, another Old Testament quote. But then we look over at the second side of the page where it says heirs, and that's Isaac inheriting his father's estate, his wealth. But not only that, more importantly than the flocks and herds and wealth of Abraham, he inherited the spiritual blessing of being a part of that promised seed. And then under that, I want you to put in your notes that the children of, Is, uh, of Ishmael would be cursed, whereas the children of Isaac would be blessed. And we read throughout the Old Testament, those who bless Israel will be blessed by God. Those who curse Israel will be cursed by God. And that animosity that started with Ishmael and Isaac has continued 
over the centuries. And of course, the Babylonian captivity that we read about. Remember with Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel? Babylon was a part of a Arab nation, part of the seed through Ishmael. We read about the Assyrian captivity, 722 BC. Again, taking Israelites into captivity as slaves. Once again, Assyrian Empire, where did they come from? They were children of Ishmael. You see the Crusades in the early part of A.D. What was it? It was a battle between the Arabs and the Israelites. And the Holy War and some others as well involved in that. And we continue to see over the centuries the animosity between the Arab world and Israel. And now between the Arab world and Again, and I'm speaking of those, not, not putting everybody into a bucket, but I'm just saying um, the radical groups that are even now attacking, of course, Christianity as well. Because as Christians, who is our Savior? Jesus. And what nationality is he? He was born to Mary. He was Jewish. And so once again, um, we see the history of the animosity between and so what's the bottom line? What, why was Paul bringing all this up? The bottom line in the next slide and in your notes is that he was trying to show that through the seed of Hagar, the, the slave woman, the slave wife of Abraham, is like trying to follow the law and trying to be justified by what? By works. And justified by faith should be on the other side of the page as you see in your notes. But Paul was trying to tell us, no, 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 that's not how you live. If you put your faith in Christ, you are not justified by works. You are justified by what? Faith and faith alone. Faith plus nothing else. And again, as we've shared, it's not that we don't try to live a right life now that we have accepted Christ, but it's not our right life or our works that get us into heaven or allow us to find greater merit from God. And that's ultimately what Paul was trying to say. So I have a few application questions I want to share before we close. Number one, how are you choosing to live? And again, I, I just went with the two types of ways to live as versus the third, but you can add the third one too. Are you choosing to live as a slave, whether to the law or to sin, or are you living as a free child of God? A free child of God. Secondly, what do you believe justifies you or declares you righteous before God? Is it works or is it grace? Is it works or is it your faith alone in Christ? And then thirdly, and I, and I, I bring this insight in, is there an area of your life where you are impatient with God? and struggling to trust him. Why do I bring that up? Who was impatient with God and struggled to trust him in what we just read? Abraham and Sarah. God said, I promise you, you're going to have a child. I promise you, I'm gonna make a great nation out of you. I promise you, your seed are gonna be a spiritual blessing. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't see how God was going to do it. We're too old. There's no way we can physically do this. And there's been times in my life and probably times in your life where you're like, God, really? Are you gonna be able to really accomplish this in my life? Maybe I need to take things into my own hands. You know, young people, you know, I really wanna be married, you know? And um, are you going to have an attitude that God, I, I wanna be patient and I wanna wait for the right person that you would bring into my life? Or are you going to do what a lot of young people do and try to force it? Because a lot of young people we find are, you know, they're in love with the idea of being married more than they are in love with a person. You know, I've got to get married before I get too old, you know. And both men and women can fall into that, that trap. And that's just one example. But maybe there's something in your life where you are really struggling with being patient with God. And saying, God, you know, I know you have a heart for the situation I'm dealing with, but, you know, you're not working fast enough for me. So I got to make things happen. 
I got to step forward. And what happened when Abraham and Sarah stepped forward and, and decided to show a lack of faith? She gives Abraham a slave girl, Hagar, and he says, okay, and has a baby. And that baby, not to say babies are the problem, but through that child, my goodness, talk about a thorn in the side of God's people over the centuries. And we talk about, you know, what happened in Orlando, and we talk about the terroristic attacks. Many of them are coming from radical groups within the Arab world. I do not want to say we should hate Arab people. Are you hearing me say that? No. We need to love the Arab world and pray for them. And I, we have friends who are missionaries, you know, kind of undercover, uh, you know, to Arab people. And we want them to come to faith in Christ. And not every Arab is a terrorist, so don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But it is really interesting what happens when you don't choose to trust God and you take things into your own hands. There's a lot of consequences, negative, that can happen. And so I want to encourage you to choose to live as a free child of God today on Father's Day, to choose to live with the attitude that I am justified by faith alone and that I am going to be patient with what I hope and want God to do in my life, things I prayed about for years, whatever it might be, I'm going to wait on my good, good Heavenly Father. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you again for your word. And my word, how significant this passage of Scripture is in helping us to kind of even understand the world that we live in today, why there's so much conflict, why there's so much bloodshed, why there's so much hate in our world. And we see uh, that rivalry that started years ago because of the lack of patience and trust in Abraham and Sarah. And though you did absolutely bless Abraham and Sarah and you fulfilled your promise through Isaac and Jacob and through that seed and ultimately brought a savior, Jesus, into this world. Father, we know that um, the battle rages until one day you will reign and rule. We look forward to that day. Until then, may we remember as our Heavenly Father that you will never, ever let us go, that you are holding on tight to us as your children, and you have promised to never leave us or forsake us, and you won't leave or forsake your, your chosen people today, Israel, and you won't leave us as your chosen people spiritually as sons and daughters of Abraham through faith. So thank you for your promises today in Jesus' name. Amen.